What's up, everybody? Welcome back to A People's Historian, the show where we read about 30 minutes of history together. My name is Jason Kishneff, and we're reading, uh, I forget what chapter, People's History of the United States, chapter 5, <laughs> excuse me. And, uh, yeah, if you liked the episode, hit the like and subscribe button. Hit that notification bell so you get notified when I make a new video, because YouTube has been known to, you know. Let's dig in. <clears throat> Although the numbers of independent farmers grew, according to Roland Berthoff and John Murin, the class structure did not change radically. The ruling group went through personnel changes as the rising merchant families of Boston, New York, or Philadelphia shipped quite credibly into the social status, excuse me, slipped quite credibly into the social status, and sometimes the very houses of those who failed in business or suffered confiscation and exile for loyalty to the crown. Edmund Morgan sums up the class nature of the revolution this way. The fact that the lower ranks were involved in the contest should not obscure the fact that the contest itself was generally a struggle for office and power between members of an upper class, the new against the established. Looking at the situation after the revolution, Richard Morris comments, Everywhere one finds inequality. He finds the people of we the people of the United States, a phrase coined by the very rich Governor Morris, did not mean Indians or blacks or women or white servants. In fact, there were more indentured servants than ever, and the revolution did nothing to end and little to ameliorate white bondage. Carl Degler says, no new social class came to power through the door of the American Revolution. The men who engineered the revolt were largely members of the colonial ruling class. George Washington was the richest man in America. John Hancock was a prosperous Boston merchant. Benjamin Franklin was a wealthy printer, and so on. So the poor fighting wars to benefit the rich... It's a long time theme. On the other hand, town mechanics, laborers, and seamen, as well as small farmers, were swept into the people by rhetoric of the revolution, by the camaraderie of military service, by the distribution of some land. This was created a substantial body of support, thus was created a substantial body of support a national consensus, something that, even with the exclusion of ignored and oppressed people, could be called America. Stoughton Lynn's close study of Dutchess County, New York. I'd like to see the Google automatic um, closed captioning spell Stoughton Lynn. <laughs> if, you're, if you're hard of hearing... Google is probably misspelling that. Um, Stoughton Lynn's close study of Dutchess County, New York in the Revolutionary Period corroborates this. There were tenant risings in 1766 against the huge feudal estates in New York. Holy cow. The Rensselaerwick holding was a million acres. That is quite a word. The Rensselaerwick holding was a million acres. Tenants claiming some of this land for themselves, unable to get satisfaction in the courts, turned to violence. In Poughkeepsie, 1,700 armed tenants had closed the courts and broken open the jails, but the uprising was crushed. 
During the revolution, there was a struggle in Dutchess County over the disposition of confiscated loyalist lands. But it was mainly between different elite groups. One of these, the Poughkeepsie Anti-Federalists, opponents of the Constitution, included men on the make, newcomers in land and business. They made promises to the tenants to gain their support, exploiting their grievances to build their own political careers and maintain their own fortunes. During the revolution, to mobilize soldiers, the tenants were promised land. A prominent landowner of Dutchess County wrote in 1777 that a promise to make tenants freeholders would instantly bring you at least 6,000 able farmers into the field. But the farmers who enlisted in the revolution and expected to get something out of it found that as privates in the army they received $6.66 a month, while a colonel received $75 a month. Wow! They matched local government contractors like Melanchthon Smith and Matthew Peterson. They watched local government contractors like Melanchthon Smith and Matthew Peterson become rich, while the pay they received in continental currency became worthless with inflation. This light is not nearly as bright in real life as it looks like on your screen, I assure you. All this led tenants to become a threatening force in the midst of the war. Many stopped paying rent. The, legis the legislature, worried, passed a bill to confiscate Loyalist land and add 400 new freeholders to the 1800 already in the country. This meant a strong new voting bloc for the faction of the rich that would become anti-federalist in 1788. Once the new landholders were brought into the privileged circle of the revolution and seemed politically under control, their leaders, Melanchthon Smith and others, at first opposed to adoption of the Constitution, switched to support. And with New York ratifying, adoption was ensured. The new freeholders found that they had stopped being tenants but were now mortgagees. Mortgagees paying back loans from banks instead of rent to landlords. It seems that the rebellion against British rule allowed a certain group of the colonial elite to replace those loyal to England, give some benefits to small landholders, and leave poor white working people and tenant farmers in very much their old situation. What did the revolution mean to the Native Americans, the Indians? They had been ignored by the fine words of the Declaration, had not, had not been considered equal, certainly not in choosing those who would govern the American territories in which they lived, nor in being able to pursue happiness as they had pursued it for centuries before the white Europeans arrived. Now with the British out of the way, the Americans could begin the inexorable process of pushing the Indians off their lands, killing them if they resisted. In short, as Francis Jennings puts it, the white Americans were fighting against British imperial control in the East and for their own imperialism in the West. People don't usually think of our country as imperialist. Guess our establishment doesn't like to use that word. Before the revolution, the Indians had been subdued by force in Virginia and in New England. Elsewhere, they had worked out modes of coexistence with the colonies. But around 1750, with the colonial population growing fast, the pressure to move westward onto new land set the stage for conflict with the Indians. Land agents from the east began appearing in the Ohio River Valley, 
on the territory of a confederation of tribes called the Covenant Chain, for which the Iroquois were spokesmen. In New York, through intricate swindling, 800,000 acres of Mohawk land were taken, ending the period of Mohawk-New York friendship. Chief Hendrick of the Mohawks is recorded speaking his bitterness to Governor George Clinton and the Provincial Council of New York in 1753. Brother, when we came here to relate our grievances about our lands, we expected to have something done for us. And we have told you that the covenant chain of our forefathers was like to be broken. And brother, you tell us that we shall be redressed at Albany. But we know them so well, we do not trust them. For they, the Albany merchants, are no people but devils. So... As soon as we come home, we will send up a belt of wampum to our brothers, the other five nations, to acquaint them the covenant chain is broken between you and us. So, brother, you are not to expect to hear of me any more. And, brother, we desire to hear no more of you. When the British fought the French for North America in the Seven Years' War, the Indians fought on the side of the French. The French were traitors, but not occupiers of Indian lands, while the British clearly coveted their hunting grounds and living space. Someone reported the conversations of Shingas, chief of the Delaware Indians, with the British General Braddock, who sought his help against the French. <clears throat> Shingus asked General Braddock, this is somebody's writing, Shingus asked General Braddock whether the Indians that were friends to the English might not be permitted to live and trade among the English and have hunting grounds sufficient to support themselves and families. On which General Braddock said that no savage should inherit the land. On which Shingus and the other chiefs answered that if they might not have liberty to live on the land, they would not fight for it. When that war ended in 1763, the French, ignoring their old allies, ceded to the British lands west of the Appalachians. Ceded to the British lands west of the Appalachians. The Indians, therefore, united to make war on the British western forts. This is called Pontiac's Conspiracy by the British, but a liberation war for independence in the words used by Francis Jennings. Under orders from British General Jeffrey Amherst, the commander of Fort Pitts gave the attacking Indian chiefs with whom he was negotiating blankets from the smallpox hospital. It was a pioneering effort at what is now called biological warfare. An epidemic soon spread among the Indians. Despite this and the burning of villages, the British could not destroy the will of the Indians who continued guerrilla war. A peace was made with the British agreeing to establish a line at the Appalachians beyond which settlements would not encroach on an Indian territory. This was the Royal Proclamation of 1763, and it angered Americans. The original Virginia Charter said its land went westward to the ocean. It helps us to explain why most of the Indians fought for England during the Revolution. With their French allies, then their English allies gone, the Indians faced a new land-coveting nation alone. <coughs> <coughs> The Americans assumed now that the Indian land was theirs. Of course they did. But the expeditions they sent westward to establish this were overcome, which they recognized in the names they gave these battles, Harmer's Humiliation and St. Clair's Shame. <laughs> and even when General Anthony Wayne defeated the Indians Western Confederation in 1798 at the Battle of Fallen Timbers, he had to recognize their power. 
In the Treaty of Greenville, it was agreed that in return for certain secessions of land, the United States would give up claims to the Indian lands north of the Ohio, east of the Mississippi, and south of the Great Lakes, but that if the Indians decided to sell these lands, they would offer them first to the United States. <coughs> However, as we know, our government doesn't keep any of these deals. Jennings, putting the Indians into the center of the American Revolution, after all it was Indian land that everyone was fighting over, sees the revolution as a multiplicity of variously oppressed and exploited peoples who preyed upon each other. <coughs> With the eastern elite controlling the lands on the seaboard, the poor, seeking land, were forced to go west, there becoming a useful bulwark for the rich because, as Jennings says, the first target of the Indian's hatchet was the frontiersman's skull. The situation of black slaves as a result of the American Revolution was more complex. Thousands of blacks fought with the British. 5,000 were with the revolutionaries, most of them from the North, but there were also free blacks from Virginia and Maryland. The Lower South was reluctant to arm blacks amid the urgency. <laughs> like, I've been whipping them. I don't want them killing us. Smart not to arm them. The lower South was reluctant to arm blacks. Amid the urgency and chaos of war, thousands took their freedom, leaving on British ships at the end of the war to settle in England, Nova Scotia, the West Indies, or Africa. Many others stayed in America as free blacks evading their masters. In the northern states, the combination of blacks in the military, the lack of powerful economic need for slaves, and the rhetoric of revolution led to the end of slavery, but very slowly. And the rhetoric of revol <laughs> Excuse me. As late as 1810, 30,000 blacks, one-fourth of the black population of the north remained slaves. In 1840, there were still a thousand slaves in the North. In the Upper South, there were more free Negroes than before, leading to more control legislation. In the Lower South, slavery expanded with the growth of rice and cotton plantations. <clears throat> what the revolution did was to create space and opportunity for blacks to begin making demands of white society. Sometimes these demands came from the new small black elites in Baltimore, Philadelphia, Richmond, Savannah. Sometimes from articulate and bold slaves. Pointing to the Declaration of Independence, blacks petitioned Congress and the state legislatures to abolish slavery to give blacks equal rights. In Boston, blacks asked for city money, which whites were getting. To educate their children. In Norfolk, they asked to be allowed to testify in court. Nashville blacks asserted that free Negroes ought to have the same opportunities of doing well that any person would have. Peter Matthews, a free Negro butcher in Charleston, joined other th free black artisans and tradesmen in petitioning the legislature to repeal discriminatory laws against blacks. In 1787, blacks in Dartmouth, Massachusetts petitioned the legislature for the right to vote, linking taxation to representation. We apprehend ourselves to be aggrieved in that while we are not allowing the privilege of free men of the state having no vote or influence in the election of those that tax us, Yet many of our color, as is well known, have cheerfully entered the field of battle in the defense of the common cause, and that, as we conceive, 
against a similar exertion of power in regard to taxation too well known to need a recital in this place. A black man, Benjamin Banneker, who taught himself mathematics and astronomy, predicted accurately a solar eclipse and was appointed to plan the new city of Washington, wrote to Thomas Jefferson, I suppose it is a truth too well attested to you to need a proof here that we are a race of beings who have long labored under the abuse and censure of the world, that we have long been looked upon with an eye of contempt, and that we have long been considered rather as brutish than human and scarcely capable of mental endowments. I apprehend you will embrace every opportunity to eradicate that train of absurd and false ideas and opinions which so generally prevails with respect to us and that your sentiments are concurrent with mine which are that one universal father hath given being to us all and that he hath not only made us all of one flesh but that he hath also without partiality afforded us all the same sensations and endowed us all with the same facilities <coughs> Banneker asked Jeff Jefferson <clears throat> to wean yourselves from those narrow prejudices which you have imbibed. Jefferson tried his best as an enlightened, thoughtful individual might, but the structure of American society, the power of the cotton plantation, the slave trade, the politics of unity, between northern and southern elites and the long culture of race prejudice in the colonies as well as his own weaknesses that combination of practical need and ideological fixation kept Jefferson a slave owner throughout his life the inferior position of blacks the exclusion of Indians from the new society the establishment of supremacy for the rich and powerful in the new nation, all this was already settled in the colonies by the time of the revolution. With the English out of the way, it could now be put on paper, solidified, regularized, made legitimate by the Constitution of the United States, drafted at a convention of revolutionary leaders in Pennsylvania. To many Americans over the years, the Constitution, drawn up in 1787, <clears throat> has seemed a work of genius put together by wise, humane men who created a legal framework for democracy and equality. This view is stated a bit extravagantly by the historian George Bancroft writing in the early 19th century. The Constitution establishes nothing that interferes with equality and individuality. It knows nothing of differences by descent or opinions of favored classes or legalized religion or the political power of, pros of property. It leaves the individual alongside of the individual as the sea is made up of drops. American society is composed of separate, free, and constantly moving atoms, ever in reciprocal action, so that the institutions and laws of the country rise over the masses of individual thought, which, like the water of the ocean, are rolling evermore. Another view of the Constitution was put forward early in the 20th century, by the historian Charles Beard, arousing anger and indignation, including a denunciatorial editorial in the New York Times. He wrote in his book, An Economic Interpretation of the Constitution, Inasmuch as the primary object of a government, beyond the mere representation of physical violence, 
excuse me, beyond the mere repression of physical violence, is the making of the rules which determine the property relations of members of society. The dominant classes whose rights are thus to be determined must perforce obtain from the government such rules as are constant with the larger interests necessary to the continuance of their economic processes, or they must themselves control the organs of government. <coughs> In short, Beard said the rich must, in their own interest, either control the government directly or control the laws by which government operates. Beard applied this general idea to the Constitution by studying the economic backgrounds and political ideas of the 55 men who gathered in Philadelphia in 1787 to draw up the Constitution. He found that a majority of them were lawyers by profession, that most of them were men of wealth in land, slaves, manufacturing, or shipping, that half of them had money loaned out at interest, and that 40 of the 55 held government bonds, according to the records of the Treasury Department. Thus, Beard found that most of the makers of the Constitution had some direct economic interest in establishing a strong federal government, the manufacturers needed protective tariffs. The money lenders wanted to stop the use of paper money to pay off debts. The land speculators wanted protection as they invaded Indian lands. Slave owners needed federal security against slave revolts and runaways. Bondholders wanted a government able to raise money by nationwide taxation to pay off those bonds. Four groups, Beard noted, were not represented in the Constitutional Conventions. Slaves, indentured servants, women, men without property. <coughs> and since you're going to mention slaves, I don't know why he doesn't mention Native Americans. And so the Constitution did not reflect the interests of those groups. He wanted to make it clear that he did not think the Constitution was written merely to benefit the Founding Fathers personally, although one could not ignore the $150,000 fortune of Benjamin Franklin, the connections of Al Alexander Hamilton to wealthy interests through his father-in-law and brother-in-law, the great slave plantations of James Madison, the enormous land holdings of George Washington. Rather, it was to benefit the groups of the founders represented, the economic interests they understood and felt in concrete, definite form through their own personal experience. Not everyone at the Philadelphia Convention fitted Beard's scheme. Elbridge Jerry of Massachusetts was a holder of landed property, and yet he opposed the ratification of the Constitution. Similarly, Luther Martin of Maryland, whose ancestors had obtained large tracts of land in New Jersey, opposed ratification. But with a few exceptions, Beard found a strong connection between wealth and support of the Constitution. I'm going to end there. Thanks for joining me. I hope you'll tune in next time. Hit that like and subscribe button.